So my personal journey, what happened is I was extremely anxious, extremely depressed, but I also felt extremely unwell. I kind of felt like this experience was in my body, like my solar plexus would tremble frequently. When I was triggered by something, I could almost feel the kind of electricity all around my body. Obviously, I couldn't sleep, you know, I was, I was twitching, I'd be hot, I'd be cold, all sorts of things were going on. It wasn't just I was sitting around and I was a little bit worried about, you know, what I was going to do with my children or, you know, what I was going to do for a job. And I felt like that wasn't really understood or recognized until I arrived at a small clinic, as you said, in Arizona, annexed to the Meadows Clinic, which was called Melody House. What they were really showing was that the many of the disturbances that we were feeling were unfinished responses to threats that had happened earlier in life. And that the, there's a disconnect between the way that the reptile brain, the mammal brain, and the human prefrontal cortex brain were approaching A, the problem of threat in the first place, and B, the problem of recovery from the threat. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you or your loved ones suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, stress, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health experts from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal over the long term. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. So welcome, everybody. We're here for Mind Health 360, the home of integrative mental health. And I'm interviewing Benjamin Fry, who's written a wonderful book called The Invisible Line, Flat Pack Instructions for Life. And Benjamin is a very interesting character. He is a psychotherapist who is an expert in the nervous system. And in terms of what you've done with your life, he's had a very varied and interesting life. So just to recap very quickly, you studied philosophy and physics at Oxford, and then you got a degree, a master's in film in California, and then you sort of dabbled in nightclubs and restaurants and hotels, and then you trained as a psychotherapist, and while you were training as a psych psychotherapist or afterwards, you basically had a nervous breakdown and ended up in the Priory and then ended up in the Meadows and were really sort of in despair. I mean, you were suicidal, you had five young children, you'd lost all your money. And I think it's fair to say you were pretty desperate. Mm -hmm. And yet as a trained psychotherapist, um, it must've been quite an interesting experience for you to be on the other side as a patient and to find that actually there were very few answers, very few solutions to your mental health problems. I think you found that in the Priory and the Meadows and medication, nothing really helped you. And then you found a small unit near the Meadows and that kind of completely changed your life. And you were then diagnosed with PTSD from the death of your mother when you were 11 months old. And through working with that very early pre-verbal childhood trauma for a month in this special trauma unit in the US, you were able to completely recover your mental health and go on to then come back to the UK, found your own trauma clinic to replicate what you'd seen in the US, which had really worked for you called Chiron House, and now it's Chiron Clinics. And then you've gone on to become a sort of pioneer of nervous system mental health or sort of solutions to your mental health via nervous system regulation. And you've written this wonderful book. So you wrote a couple of books. One of them was How I Fucked Up My Life and Made It Mean Something. And the other one, your recent one, is The Invisible Lion, which is all about the nervous system. And so what I'm particularly interested in, certainly you've had a very interesting path from a personal perspective. And I think for anyone working in mental health, it's been a very sort of non-unconventional path where drugs didn't work for you or they work to an extent but not completely and yet you were able to really find sustainable solutions to your mental health issues which were quite vast at the time I mean you were suicidal you were having panic attacks you were incredibly anxious you were pretty dysfunctional 
Um, and so I think from a personal perspective, we're interested in how you did that. But also from my perspective, I'm particularly interested in sort of 360 degrees of mental health and how all the things in, you know, the sort of panoply of uh, solutions that we might have for people's mental health problems, you know, how what you do with the nervous system fits in to that sort of toolbox that we have in terms of helping people with mental health issues. And especially in terms of seeing mental health issues as nervous system dysregulation. And I know that you're quite a pioneer with the likes of sort of Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote Body Keeps the Score, Stephen Porges, who wrote the polyvagal theory, and others like that, who are real pioneers of sort of I think you call it nervous system physio physiology or psychobiology, or I'm sure you'll tell us what that is. So I will now shut up and let you <laughs> you talk about your experience. And um, but I think we're all very interested in finding out about how you can treat these very common mental health systems, which are sadly far too common, by regulating the nervous system and how that fits in from a biochemical perspective and also from a psycho-spiritual perspective. So I'll shut up and let you talk. <laughs> well, you're, you're very kind. and Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. I think what's interesting is you talk a lot in your introduction about the phrase mental health. And so it's relevant to ask the question, well, what do we mean when we say mental health? Another thing I'm aware of from your work is that one of your ideas about what Mind Health 360 is about is head to toe mental health. So how can you incorporate the idea of mental health with the concept of something that's from head to toe? And what are we talking about? We start to begin to talk in contradictions before we even begin. And I think that's where the problem begins. And it's also where the solutions start to emerge. So there's a movement from, I think, in roughly the late 70s, Pioneers like Stephen Porges, Peter Levine, and others in America, particularly, were looking at how biophysiology, i.e., the stuff that is between the top of your head and the bottom of your feet, is actually affecting your what we consider to be mental health. But then you have to ask, well, what is mental health? Often people think about emotions, they think about thoughts, they think about behavior. And all of these categories get swept into this idea of mental health. You know, another famous pioneer, Daniel Siegel, started his career as a, a psychiatrist at UCLA by convening a group of interdisciplinary uh, people in the university to try and answer the question, when we say mental health, what are we talking about? What mm. is mind? What does mind even mean? And he's been quite celebrated in his, uh, in his work that's come out of that. So I think... I think to introduce the concepts, really, uh, the nicest metaphor that I can help people with often is one of a chain of dominoes. If you think about a long chain of dominoes falling on top of each other, what you often find is that the final domino to fall is where we focus our attention as healthcare professionals. So if the final domino to fall is this sense of extreme lethargy and misery, uh, we'll say we're depressed and because that's a word that's been used to mean those symptoms. It doesn't really tell us much, though. We don't really know what being depressed is because someone says we're depressed. It just sort of sounds right because it's almost like there's something pressing us down. Uh, equally, if the final domino to fall is we're extremely hypervigilant and worried and have racing thoughts and can't sleep, then we'll say we're anxious. And that seems to make sense to us. But equally... We haven't really explained anything. So what we tend to do in this thing we call mental health is we tend to look at the final domino and describe it. And then from common descriptions that lots of different people give, we attach a label. So we'll say you're anxious, we'll say you're depressed, we'll say you're bipolar, we'll say all sorts of things. There's even a book in America called the DSM-5, which has about 500 and something categories. And they even have things like shopping disorder and grief disorder and everything's a disorder. And what it tends to mean is that we've noticed that there's a commonality of reports of symptoms from patients who say, you know, I'm not coping. I've been bereaved recently and I haven't recovered. And so they'll be labeled with grief disorder as if, you know, as if that's like finding a virus or a bacteria or finding cancer. It, it doesn't actually mean anything. So 
the way to unwind from that position, as useful as it is for shortcuts for conversations and diagnostic criteria, maybe even charts for medications, it doesn't give us a causal account of anything. So it's not particularly helpful in providing an intuitive sense of how to fix anything. I mean, for example, if you were to find that your foot was hurting and you went to the doctor and you said you've got hurting foot disorder, it doesn't really tell you much. It might validate your pain and you would realize that you were not alone, but you're not going to go home and think, I know what to do now. Whereas if he looks at your foot and says you've got a thorn in your foot, then it both validates and explains the pain, but also points you in the right direction of what to do for treatment. So I think really the, the revolution that's occurred in what we think of now as mental and behavioral health treatment has been working further up the chain of dominoes. So first of all, think about trying to lift the final domino. It's very heavy because all the other dominoes are leaning on top of it. And there are various strategies for doing that in, uh, in this area we call mental health. And they usually just either you talk to someone or you give them drugs. There really isn't much else to do. You can change your behavior to a certain extent. But that's about it. So the, the activity of talking, the therapy and the, the self-talk, if you like, becomes quite hard work because you're lifting all of these dominoes. And the medications themselves have to work quite hard. And the more severe your condition, the more medication you have to take and the more side effects you might have. So instead of that, if we start to think, well, what does it feel like to work further up the chain of dominoes? You begin to look at where that chain goes. And generally speaking, anything that has arrived at a final point of emotion or cognition or behavior, which is usually a hybrid result of both, has started lower in the brainstem. And as you go lower into the brainstem, you get into the mammalian brain, you get into the reptilian brain, and then actually you just get into the body. So this idea of yours of head-to-toe mental health is very uh, very apposite because the, the entire chain of dominoes is somewhere from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. And if you start to work in there, you start to have different ways of addressing the problems, different solutions. So in my personal journey, what happened is I was extremely anxious, extremely depressed, but I also felt extremely unwell. I kind of felt like this experience was in my body, like my solar plexus would tremble frequently. When I was triggered by something, I could almost feel the kind of electricity all around my body. Obviously, I couldn't sleep. You know, I was, I was twitching, I'd be hot, I'd be cold. All sorts of things were going on. It wasn't just... I was sitting around and I was a little bit worried about, you know, what I was going to do with my children or, you know, what I was going to do for a job. And I felt like that wasn't really understood or recognized until I arrived at a small clinic, as you said, in Arizona, annexed to the Meadows Clinic, which was called Melody House. And we learned about the work of Peter Levine, of Stephen Porges, and others. And <clears throat> what they were really showing was that the many of the disturbances that we were feeling were unfinished responses to threats that had happened earlier in life. And that the, there's a disconnect between the way that the reptile brain, the mammal brain, and the human prefrontal cortex brain were approaching, A, the problem of threat in the first place, and B, the problem of recovery from the threat. Uh, and then the work of Stephen Porges put, the, put a kind of anatomical wrapper around this to, to give a, a very good mechanistic explanation of the pathways in the body that are related to mammals and related to reptiles and related to, if you like, the human. So you, you have this Stevens theory of the polyvagal theory, which uh, is really about these two vagus nerves in the body, one of which activates, if you like, the human mammal and the social engagement system, as he calls it, the other one of which will activate the reptile. And sandwiched in between them is the mammal, which has the sympathetic nervous system function, which is kind of the, the fight-flight place. So between the three of them, you've got kind of calm, resting, socializing, fighting and running away and being completely dormant, as in sort of frozen in, in, in fear. And although that's a simple model, it does go some way to explaining the physiology of common mental health problems like depression, like anxiety, and even social withdrawal or social anxiety. 
And so very quickly, you go from this kind of etiological model of, oh, sorry, it's phenomenological model of I've, I've noticed everyone is anxious and called them anxious to an etiological model, which is saying, look, here's 100 million years of evolution and here's how the body is built. And if you turn the switch left, it feels like this. If you turn the switch right, it feels like that. And oh, look, that looks exactly like anxiety and depression. And then the question is, well, what's moving these switches? And that's where people like Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk were so helpful because they showed that people who, whose physiology hadn't finished responding to threat. So if you like, those different pathways, those different switches had not yet completed their natural arc. And people would become stuck in these places. And so you could be permanently shut down or permanently overexcited. You could be permanently depressed or permanently anxious because you're still living in, say, this frightening house you grew up with your alcoholic father or the battlefield that you haven't really come back from or the car crash or the building collapse you were in last week. So these things were about the organic, evolved, physiological response to threat and danger that the body could not help itself but to have. And then it was about the lack of resolution, the lack of, of clearing of that experience through the physiology. And these were the earlier dominoes. So what would happen is these dominoes were set up and then they'd all be falling all over the place chaotically, not as they're supposed to do, not as they do in simpler mammals. But the end result of it was all we were looking at. So you had this entire area called mental health where people are looking at all the final dominoes and the, these pioneers of a different way, if you like, neurobiologically informed healthcare, looking at neurobiology and looking at anatomy, looking at evolution and looking at causation, we're holding up their hands and saying, hey, there's another way to look at this. And not only is there another way to look at it, but if you actually follow the treatments implied by looking at it differently, we're helping people and people are getting better. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I spent a year going around a system that told me I needed drugs and CBT. And that when anything went wrong and it didn't work, it was my fault. Until I got to a place where I met professionals that said, we know what's wrong with you. You've got PTSD from your childhood. Uh, your trauma is in your body. The problem's in your body. And we're going to work on physiological treatments, which, funnily enough, just come down mainly to talking to someone. But instead of talking about their thoughts and feelings, you're talking about their sensations. And there are other innovations like EMDR, but what's really interesting is that most of this is contained within something that's not innovative at all, which is things like yoga and tai chi and meditation and mindfulness, which have been around since the dawn of healthcare itself. So somehow through this retreat from this description of problems as being about mental health to a kind of anatomical scientific view of it, you go all the way back to the earliest healthcare interventions, which appear to be quasi uh, quasi religious or quasi foolish even but they're now given credence by modern science so you've gone from a kind of thesis to an antithesis to a synthesis where superstition has been brought through the age of reason and we're coming out the other side but these days if you go to a doctor everything is mindfulness with chips <laughs> you know, whatever your treatment is whack in a bit of mindfulness on the side and it'll improve that's because it improves the nervous system, which improves the chain of dominance. So essentially, and that's super helpful, so thank you for that. That's fascinating. I just wanted to clarify one thing. At some point you were talking about the mammal's response and then the reptile's response, and then you said in the middle there was a mammal response, and I wasn't sure if that was if mm -hmm. I understood that correctly. And you said sandwich between the mammal and the reptile, essentially, but I wasn't quite sure if I'd understood that. Sure. Sorry, I'm reasonably confusing. But if you build it evolutionary through time, it's a little bit more obvious. So you start looking at what did, what did animals do in response to threat? And it seems from the fossil records that what they did is they, they started to learn to freeze. Then they started to learn to run away and fight. And then they started to learn to be kind of hypervigilant, which is to see the problem sooner. And then they started to learn to actually socialize to defeat the problem before it even happens. So they get in bigger groups, but they also bring people into their groups rather than alienate them. And these were seen as specific stages of evolution, but they also have specific anatomical architectures, which you can see in humans now and in the fossil record. So 
you've got a, a reptile brain, which is a tiny little thing at the base of your skull, which is connected to the dorsal vagus nerve. And that will do the freezing bit, mainly. I mean, I'm talking very broad strokes here, but that's the idea. So there's one layer. Then you've got the mammal brain, which is in the middle of your brain, which is a bit bigger. And that's connected to the sympathetic nervous system. That's the thing that excites you into fight or into flight. And then you've got this human brain. It's enormous okay. prefrontal cortex, which is most of our brain. And that is the thing that then will organize your behavior, gives you thinking power, makes you want to collaborate with people, cooperate, keeps you safe effectively through controlling your environment, controlling yourself and controlling others. And so you can see that the response to threat of all three would not be unified. Mm. And so what happens is you tend to pick one and you go back in time as problems escalate. So a mild sense of threat, you'll try and talk it through, sort it out. If it gets out of control, you'll probably run for your life or fight for your life. And if you're overwhelmed, chances are you'll freeze. And that's the way it works. But that's fine if, you're, if you are being chased by a lion. I mean, this is the idea in my book is that the lion's invisible for many of us now. If you're actually being chased by a lion, that's a healthy response. Take the lion out of the picture and you'll call someone with a mental health problem. Right. So that's the point, really. What is a mental health problem? A mental health problem looks exactly like someone who's completely healthy, but you can't see the lion. Understood. And so the prefrontal cortex of the human part of your brain is the one that's connected to your social engagement system, presumably what you were saying is the one of the parts of the vagus nerve. So the, the frontal vagus, which is connected to the, the social engagement system, yeah. which itself is connected to the sort of human prefrontal cortex. Is that correct? It's something like that. I mean, this is Stephen Porges' great breakthrough, is that he described the vagus nerve, which is this enormous nerve that wanders around the body. It's called the vagus because it wanders around. He realized that it had developed two parts at two different times in evolution. So the rear va vagus nerve, called the dorsal vagus nerve, was connected to the lower reptile brain. Right. And that would then just slow people down and shut them down. And it's also connected to most of the organs below the diaphragm. So when people are really shut down, they often report that their digestion is difficult or they have what's called subdiaphragmatic organ problems. And the, the front vagus nerve, the dorsal vagus nerve, is... The front, so the ventral vagus. Oh, sorry, yeah. the ventral vagus yeah. nerve. Yeah, the front ventral vagus nerve comes from the brain into the heart. Right. And what that does is it actually slows you down. It's a break. So if you take that break away, everything speeds up. Now what this means is that you, you're basically suppressing the mammal with the ventral vagus nerve. And so the two vagus nerves developed at different times and they have opposite effects in that the, the rear one slows your body down to a standstill. You pull that off and then the sympathetic nervous system from the mammal will take over and speed you up. You then put a break on that, decelerate that with the ventral vagus nerve, which is the human's idea about connecting and being safe and being calm with people. So when you're socializing with someone and you really like them and you're getting on with them and you're connecting with them, all these ideas of like, I'm connecting, I'm close to you. You notice that we all calm down and we feel happier and more relaxed and any idea of fight or flight goes out the window. But when we don't connect so well, when it feels awkward or difficult or we're agitated, we'll notice that we get anxious. And actually what we often feel in our body is we feel like we want to, to move or we feel very constrained, like we, we, we can't do the things we really want to do and often we want to just get out of there. Mm. So you can feel the fight-flight energy beginning to come up. And this is the removal of the front vagus nerve, that that uh, the tone in that nerve is coming off. And so we go into more of an anxious state. And you go through that all the way out the other side, you get into the rear vagus nerve, which then starts to just shut us down completely. And that's usually a response to being overwhelmed by the sympathetic nervous system. So overwhelmed by the fight flight type energy. And it just feels like it's not getting us anywhere and we can't do it and we get very shut down. Understood. So this is all fascinating because essentially what you're doing is you're looking at sort of the common symptoms of depression and anxiety, which all of us 
a lot of us have experienced, but then, you know, you have people who are really crippled by depression and anxiety. And currently, you know, one of the issues that I talk about a lot with my website is that, you know, you, you go to a psychiatrist or a doctor and they'll put you on drugs or they'll give you some CBT, some talk therapy if you're lucky. But essentially, they're not looking at the root cause, which is what you were saying as well, the, the, the root cause being sort of the first dominoes. Now, the interesting thing is that you explain the root cause and you and sort of your cohorts and your peers in the neurobiology of the nervous system as being very nervous system driven. So it's a very primitive response, which then affects your nervous system, which then manifests in what we know as depression and anxiety. Now, I'm quite interested in functional medicine, psychiatry, and integrative mental health, which are movements in the U.S. and starting in the U.K., which really look at the sort of, they look at the root cause also of depression and anxiety and bipolar and different mental health issues. And, you know, one of the more common explanations is inflammation, neuroinflammation. So we now see depression as a sort of inflammatory disease. Now we know that stress, anxiety, you know, stress, mm -hmm. which in your terminology you would probably call essentially a dysregulated nervous system, a chronically dysregulated nervous system. So we talk about chronic stress as causing issues with your adrenal hormones, et cetera. And you can talk about adrenal burnout or imbalanced HPA, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access. And you talk about it in terms of the nervous system. And I find that quite interesting because before I met you, I always you know, I was a big advocate of integrative mental health. And I thought, yes, you know, you look at the hormones, you look at the toxicity levels, you look at your nutrition levels, your gut, etc. And then, um, as on my website, you have the biochemistry, then you have the psycho spiritual issues such as childhood trauma, difficult life circumstances, lack of purpose and meaning, and then you have lifestyle, behavioral issues such as poor sleep, lack of exercise, etc. So what I'm really interested in is putting the nervous system work that you do quite successfully and that in your clinic, you find that you have people who come to you after having been to, you know, lots of other places and which were unable to help them. And you're able to help them and get them better. And yet you're not doing all these other pieces. You're not doing the hormone tests and the gut tests and the um, toxicity levels, etc. So is it just a different way of formulating the problem, but it's still a very integrative way? And do you think that, for instance, you could improve your treatments if you were to look at other aspects of biochemistry and the biology and the biochemical imbalances, such as gut issues and you know, toxicity levels, and how do the two link? I think these are really important good, and good questions. Uh, so if you think about the chain of dominoes, one of the questions to ask is, well, what are the dominoes? And then there's another question to ask, which is, well, is it always a chain of dominoes? Or is there any circularity? Or is there any looping? Is there any feedback effect? And of course, the body is so massively and magnificently complex that any way we talk about it is going to be a metaphor. The best way in the world, we're never going to describe exactly what every chemical does to every chemical to talk about the body would be incomprehensible. So I think that you, you, have to, you have to allow into any model complexity, but also the kind of interface and interaction with another model. And I think in this case, I can see that there, there's a chain of dominoes for each person. And for some of them, some of the earlier dominoes may be more biochemical than, if you like, psycho-spiritual or psychosocial or related to relationships or trauma or experiences. And with other people, it may be the other way around. And for some, it may be all of one or all of the other. And then it can get even more complicated in that I'm sure there is a feedback effect. So, for example, if my body is behaving as if I'm constantly running away from a lion, which I was once, but I'm not anymore, but I'm stuck there, chances are that anything that's perhaps inflammatory to my system will have a greater effect. Mm. So if I come across, uh, for example, toxins, or if I come across some virus, because I'm, my body's already busy running away from a lion and has been doing that for 20 years when it should have been doing it for two minutes, I'm going to have less resilience. A lot of what you want to think about in terms of 
the body systems comes down to resilience and set points and homeostasis. So yes, anything can happen. You know, I can go outside on a cold day and get cold. I come home and I usually warm up. My body will return to the same temperature and the, you know, the, the extremities, my fingers and toes will get warm again. And what we've got to think about is how, how much are we affecting our, our resilience in one system by overworking and burning out another system. And I think this can go both ways. So if you've got a very serious toxic poisoning, say, from heavy metals, I think your nervous system will be running very, very hot all the time. If you add into that some stress in your life, what's going to happen is that it's going to trigger all the unfinished business from stresses in the past, and there'll be no room in that system to absorb that, to process that, or to recover from that, or even to repress that, which may be what you needed to do. And so you can end up looking crazy. Equally, I think if you're, you know, like in my case, you've had emotional injuries in early childhood, and then these are reactivated by uh, parallel actions in uh, you know, an adult life, you'll probably find that as, as the, the threat response is trying to work its way through and the whole nervous system is compromised, its resilience and functioning is compromised by that, that all sorts of other things are more difficult. For example, I remember becoming very thin when I started to go into a real sense of breakdown. And, uh, you know, maybe it's because I was just running away from a lion so much I couldn't stop to eat. But really, I think it's just my metabolism was running incredibly high. And I just couldn't really absorb or retain nutrients. So I became thinner and thinner and thinner. I don't think I was eating any differently to before. Mm -hmm. So I, I completely accept and would advocate that there's a place for... If you like, just taking a broadside at all dominoes. So when I went into treatment, I was desperate. And you know, my sense of it was I was either going to get well there or I was going to die. This was my last throw of the dice. I would have welcomed someone bringing everything and anything. And in fact, I was on, I was on a small dose of antidepressants when I was put in the hospital there. And that facilitated me to be well enough to do the therapeutic work, which enabled my nervous system to recover and to regulate. Could I have been tested for the kind of things you do, like toxicity, thyroid, hormones, gut imbalances? Could I have been prescribed three meals a day of particular kind and supplements instead of just medication? Yeah, why not? You know, there, there could only have been good outcomes from that. My view at the time was I was so severely unwell that the idea of using anything other than a sledgehammer to crack this nut seemed a bit off. And in fact, one of the early interventions that really helped me was EMDR, but done in a residential setting where I was safe and contained, and it was really quite brutal. So it was like a sledgehammer. But what I've noticed in my own recovery as I've gone through it, is it's a bit like you take care of one of the dominoes, and you can start to feel the other one. Because if mm. you imagine they're all pressing on each other, you want to wriggle one. And then as you wriggle that one, and that one's a little less troubled, you can kind of feel the next one and the next one. And this was 10 years ago that I was in treatment in Arizona. And really only now I'm getting much more interested in things like, you know, gut intolerances or supplements or even toxicity or electro, what's it called? EMF. EMF, electromagnetic field. Yeah. yeah. So I used to poo-poo all these things and now I'm getting more interested in them and beginning to take them more seriously. So... I, I think in the modern panoply of this thing that we've come to call mental health, which I always think shouldn't be called mental health because I think it is in our body from our head to our toe and just shows up in these concepts that we attribute to the mind. We should test and treat and work on and think about everything. Absolutely. I mean, I totally agree. And I mean, that's certainly why I call my website Mind Health 360, because I think unless you take a 360 degree, degree approach to healing, and unless you look at all the factors that are impacting your mental health, you, you won't sustainably heal. The interesting part is also how these other factors influence the nervous system and vice versa. And so I think what you're saying is that the nervous system might already be dysregulated and that will exacerbate you know, your reaction to chemicals, gut intolerances, viruses, bacteria, etc., 
Or you could simply have a gluten intolerance, which will jangle your nervous system over years and years. If you have, you know, celiac disease that's been undiagnosed, then that's going to cause sort of inflammation, which is then going to impact your nervous system. So I find these things fascinating. I'm also interested, though, in terms of treatment, because obviously, you know, from a functional medicine perspective, we treat with supplements and probiotics, and we try and use herbs and detoxification methods and things that really can lower inflammation, you know, boost our resilience and improve our gut and improve the, the physiological components of this. But from the perspective of what you guys do with the nervous system, what are your sort of choice methods of working with the nervous system to enable it to function more optimally? I mean, I know you've mentioned EMDR, but what are the other things that you do and how do they work on the nervous system? And, you know, tell us how you've seen that that can actually, lo over the long term, create a sustainable recovery. I mean, certainly you seem very recovered compared to where you were 10, 10 years ago. I mean, you're a com presumably a completely different person. So, you know, I'd be interested in hearing a bit more about the solutions that you bring to the table and you and your cohorts in terms of healing the nervous system. And, you know, show that these could work either in conjunction with sort of traditional psychi psychiatric treatment or instead of even. Mm. Well, the the answer to that usually comes in two parts, and because there's two sides to the trauma coin, if you like. If you think about these things as unfinished responses to earlier events, which have been so overwhelming, or we might say traumatic, that we needed to finish our reactions to them slowly or finish them later, this tends to have uh, it tends to affect us in two important ways. One is that we either overreact or underreact to things that come next. And that's because we're either overreacting because we're, it's like an additive effect that we're adding some extra reaction from before, or we're underreacting because we've added so much that we just freeze, mm. we lock up. And then the consequence of this uh, for most humans in our life is it affects our ability to get into the social engagement system. And so our relationships tend to be fairly poor. The reason why that's important to say is that there's a feedback effect here because relate the quality of relationships actually holds and regulates the quality of our nervous system and so if your nervous system's in bad shape chances are your relationships get in worse shape which means that your nervous system gets in worse shape which means that your relationships get in worse shape and so on so you have this vicious cycle of things deteriorating but also a virtuous cycle of things improving and so when you look at treating someone on a nervous system model, you're looking at these two things. You're first of all looking at treating their relationships and their ability to be in relationship. And then you're looking at treating their nervous system and their ability to organically, internally hold their nervous system somewhere in the middle of fight, flight, or freeze. And of course, if you work successfully with people in group settings and in community settings, you can really improve their experience of individual relationships from time to time. And this can really help them to improve their own organic sense of connection with their nervous system. Now, the, uh, the original model for this is mothering an infant. So infants are born without much capacity to regulate. They're not really dysregulated, but they're just not yet old enough to do everything for themselves like in other areas. And what they tend to find is that if there's a caregiver who's really closely attached, and the word often used is attuned, then this caregiver will regulate that infant's nervous system for them. And by doing so, the infant then learns how to do it. It's like watching your adult walk. You can learn how to walk, and they help you walk. They hold your hands, and then the next thing you know, you're walking. So specifically, the treatment program of something like our residential program at Chiron Clinics involves uh, plenty of group work in different ways. And the individual work is about doing psychology techniques, which are largely speaking focused on how well the body is regulated and also the unfinished response to earlier threats. So an ideal day in treatment might involve an individual session of something like somatic experiencing or sensory motor psychotherapy or EMDR. These are all techniques to get into the lower parts of the brainstem 
not to just talk about your thoughts and feelings and your childhood and your mother and all that normal stuff, but to talk about your sensations and talk about what you notice in your body as you're having a relationship in the room, live, with your therapist. Or you're telling a story about someone in the house who's annoyed you. And then you notice that, as a therapist, you can notice that the client sort of shifts their posture. And you can ask them, you know, what just happened? And you go into that sensation. And you can often then use that sensation to float back in time. And that'll take you into the history as told to you by the reptile or told to you by the mammal, not told to you by the human. And when you go there, you shift the bandwidth in the brain into the mammal and the reptile brains. And that's where organic recovery can happen. Because these, uh, these parts of our brain have known what to do for 100 million years. They know how to recover from shock and from nearly being eaten by a lion and all these things. It's just been part of our evolutionary heritage. So really, a lot of that work is about getting the human mind out of the way and asking the prefrontal cortex, can you just get out of the way and let this happen, please? Once you get to that point, which ironically you often do with a bit of psychoeducation, which is what I wrote my book for, you persuade the prefrontal cortex to get out of the way, and then the mammal and the reptile can do their thing, finish up what was unfinished, and often that will then allow you to begin to return more easily to a regulated place in the middle where you're not overreacting or underreacting. And then the group structure and the group dynamics and the relationships that you learn to have healthily also hold you in some kind of middle place because uh, like in a therapy group, you're not allowed, it, well, you're, not, you're encouraged not to be totally shut down and absent. You're encouraged not to be over the top and confrontational and abusive. You have to find a way to bring your experience, but bring it in a way that holds it and holds it in some sort of place of regulation. And the interesting thing is that it's much easier to do that when there's a group holding you than just to do it on your own. So this is why I think things like 12-step meetings work so well, because a really good meeting where people are really working that, those meetings well will leave everyone feeling better regulated than when they came in. And if you're well regulated, you don't need substance to regulate you. So you have a longer time period before you feel like your body needs regulating by some sort of chemical. And if you can then get to another meeting before the end of that window, you can do it again and do it again. So specifically, treatment revolves around these body referencing psychotherapies pioneered by people like Pat Ogden and Peter Levine. And, you know, even now, Stephen Porges, polyvagal theory is turning into a kind of polyvagal informed way of working. They all address the lower parts of the brain. And some of them, I think sensory motor psychotherapy specifically address how that turns into or, you know, if you like, the dominoes fall to attachment and to relationship issues as well. So you can follow the dominoes back from attachment and relationship into the body. And then we work on putting people into relationship with each other. That's why Chiron House in Melody House, where I went to in America, works so well as a residential program, because you're forced into things that when you're anxious and depressed, you just want to avoid people. Mm. But you're pushed together and then you're pushed to relate healthily. And certainly in my case, I feel like probably it's the first time I had a healthy relational experience, probably since I was with my mother when I was six months old. And I had these moments where I felt connected to people. They weren't even people I particularly liked or was getting on with or agreed with. But because I was in my truth and they were in their truth and we were both safe, that was a very transformational thing. And it's hugely regulating. And it brings a huge sense of safety to the personal nervous system system. And then if your system is safe and you're safe, then you have a lot of space to finish all your unfinished business from before. So it works both ways. And around that, you support the system and you support resilience in the community with things which give people greater awareness of their bodies and of themselves so that they can do these programs successfully. So yoga and Tai Chi and mindfulness, meditation, even physical fitness, these are all part of getting people back into their bodies and into self-awareness. And of course, those are the things people have been doing for thousands of years. Mm. So we end up finding that what, what we want to do with people to support these newfangled 
alleged scientific methods of working is what people have wanted to do with themselves forever. For many years. But would you say that anybody who came to you with depression or anxiety, so now, you know, you used to work as a psychotherapist. I know you're not working as a psychotherapist per, per se now, but say you were. You know, would you say that anybody who came to you with symptoms of depression or anxiety or panic attacks or insomnia would benefit from the nervous system work that you do? And if so, would they have to be in the sort of group context that you described to make it work? Or do you think they could reach similar sort of similar states of success through doing things like yoga and tai chi and meditation, which they can do alone. I mean, would you advocate as a sort of ideal scenario that they would first do the group therapies and the somatic healing and the all the, the body therapies that you describe and the group therapies? Well, I think you... Uh, it's interesting because you can begin to frame all of these questions differently by saying, what if we actually define the problem as... Uh, if you like, the polyvagal system gone wrong. Mm. So we define the problem as a, a nervous system that's not functioning as I'd like it to function. And then you can begin to think, well, what are the possible solutions to that? So being put in a situation where you simulate or create a safe relationship is relaxing and beneficial for your nervous system. And so are lots of other things. So it's again, it's a bit like what we talked about before. If you're really in crisis, wouldn't you want to just try everything simultaneously? Right. So if you're in such a state of crisis, you need to be in a residential program, why not do it all? But if you're just wandering around living your life and you're trying to, uh, you know, you're a bit worried well, or you actually just, you want a positive health experience, you want to get better. There's nothing wrong with trying one thing at a time or one thing after each other. What regulates one person doesn't necessarily regulate another person. And it's a bit like looking at a crystal through different faces. You're looking at the same thing, but you're looking through different faces of the crystal and using different language and different modalities and different methods. But even when we do outpatient work, which we do in London, we, we offer a program where there are groups and there are individual sessions. And I think it's fair to say that probably on balance, our experience is that we get better results for people who do both. Right. Do one. That doesn't mean to say we don't get good results with people who do just one or just the other. Mm. So it, it depends largely on the individual. And I think that one of the, uh, you know, if you think about the future of this thing we call psychiatry now, mm. it's much more likely to be multifaceted and a bit more humble, I think, mm. where we say, you know, I can look at this crystal through any of these faces and I can look at it through all of them. But we're going to have to collaborate to explore, to discover. And, you know, I can do tests on you and we can try things and you can try things and we'll begin to find what works. And the complicated thing, of course, is that medicines you can just do to someone. Right. Things like supplements and nutrition, you rely on them actually taking them. And psychology is something where you can't do it to someone. You do it with them. If you like, you lead and they, they follow. They either come down the path or they don't. So if you say to people it would help you to do uh, you know, this kind of group process and see if that would be interesting for your experience of your nervous system with other people, and they don't want to do it, and they won't do it. I think that's true. And also, I think you really hit on the fact that, for instance, what I call integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry, it's all about personalized medicine, essentially. And it's all about looking at the crystal and recognizing that each individual is really that an individual and has different facets, you know, and each of those facets can be looked at differently and treated differently in order to find a sustainable solution for that particular individual. And I think that's the key is up until now, psychiatry has been a very sort of generic model of treatment, sort of a one size fits all. And that simply doesn't work really uh, sustainably in psychiatry because if you really want to get that person better you're going to have to look at all the factors that are impacting the mental health and their specific backstory and their specific mm. biochemical makeup and their specific you know life circumstances etc and and i think you know it's challenging because it means that psychiatry really has to step up to the plate and practice in a way that's probably more time consuming more expensive and more complicated because your psychiatrist 
therapist or whoever, whatever mental health worker you're working with has to become like a detective who's really exploring your particular psychological makeup and your circumstances and your biochemistry to find a sustainable solution for you that involves all these different facets of treatment, essentially. And another thing I was uh, interested in was when you were talking about addiction, and it occurred to me that sort of addiction in the nervous system you know, I always think, okay, well, addiction and mental health are very comorbid, so they're very tied. Often people are addicted to substances and behaviors to try and self-medicate from this un very uncomfortable mental health symptoms, essentially. And I think you would argue the same with the nervous system. I mean, you know, a dysregulated nervous system will create such discomfort in someone and create these mental health symptoms that will then... Uh, calls them to seek solace and and sort of rest and peace in sort of substances and behaviors. And so I was wondering whether this method of helping people that you describe is practiced in addiction centers, sort of in rehab centers around the world, or is this uh, something that you think should be done? Well, certainly, if you take a simplistic view of substances as things that are uppers or downers, We've talked a lot about the nervous system either being too up or too down, and that the goal, the, the kind of definition of the opposite of what you might think of as mental health is to get the nervous system regulated in the middle. So a good shortcut to, to a nervous system that's too up is to take a downer, or too down is to take an upper. And certainly alcohol is a fantastic antidote to overactivation in the sympathetic nervous system. Mm. It only lasts about 20 minutes, then you need some more, and then you've got all the side effects and and you go on from there. So it doesn't really, really work, but it's a nice shortcut from time to time. So, yes, I mean, you're asking, are nervous system referencing therapies in use in addiction treatment centers around the world? Certainly they are in, use, in some use in some. Mm. And, of course, the Meadows, where I began this journey, is an addiction recovery center. Right. Uh, they no longer have Melody House there, though, which I think tells you something. You know, the nervous system referencing speciality as aftercare was uh, dropped, but they brought some of the lessons into their larger treatment plan. The problem is, and I think it's a specific problem, is that for lots of these larger institutions, they work to a menu that's accepted by insurance companies. And uh, this is the future. This is not the present or the past of treatment. So there's a lag, in, particularly in America with insurance companies and in Britain with the NHS guidelines that are lagging you know, years and years and years behind the leading edge of this kind of behavior, this kind of treatment. But I, I think that you know, where, you, where you can really get deeper into these questions is actually by beginning to ask if we're asking the right questions. I was talking to Stephen Porges recently and he was saying, that it begins to become more interesting to start to, rather than ask, can you treat a problem by addressing the nervous system? You start to ask, can you actually define a problem by describing the nervous system? So we could drop a lot of these labels. We could drop the idea of anxiety and depression being comorbid with um, addiction. And we could say, how is this person's nervous system functioning? How are... You know, where is their two vagus nerves going? Mm. And what's the relationship between them? And how's the resilience? How easily do they recover? How quickly do they activate up and down? And then as a consequence of that, we start to look at, you know, how are they in the world? I mean, this is looking at their mechanics and we're looking at them like a car. Then you say, how are they in the world? Well, you know, they're very worried. They're very supine. Or they're constantly drinking or rowing with their spouse or whatever it is. And that would usually make perfect sense. But if you start to define it as a lack of regulation in those physiological systems, then instead of thinking about treatment as different strands of something that's comorbid and, you know, over here you need a treatment for addiction, then over here you need treatment for mental health, you just say, well, for the whole chain of dominoes, we're looking at how to regulate this nervous system. So we're looking at, you know, what are all the different strategies and strands we can bring in to regulating the nervous system because we define the problem as a nervous system that's gone wrong rather than these other questions. It always seems to be slightly kind of, it's a slightly backwards question. You know, should we be 
comorbidly treating addictions or mental health problems. What I think we should be doing is giving up talking about either of them and treating the real problems. Understood. And I mean, that brings me back also to my original question about hormones, because, you know, in functional medicine, we talk a lot about sort of chronic stress leading to chronically high cortisol, which then regulates all the other hormones and, you know, and, and the sort of neuroendocrine system. And for instance, if you have an imbalance in sex hormones like progesterone and estrogen, that can then lead to imbalanced neurotransmitters. So your estrogen is linked to your serotonin and your progesterone is linked to your GABA, which is your calming neurotransmitter. So in a way, what you're talking about is the basis of all these problems for you and your cohorts is essentially a dysregulated nervous system. Whereas in functional medicine, we can be talking about, you know, hormonal imbalances and a dysregulated neuroendocrine system. But essentially, the treatment is not sort of giving out an SSRI to sort of enhance the serotonin or giving an antidepressant, a different type of antidepressant or a sleeping pill, but it really is to go to the root cause and in your case, treat the nervous system and then maybe sort of upstream from that, treating the sort of biochemical cascade, the hormonal imbalances that come from a dysregulated nervous system. I'm just thinking of, you know, our current societies where we're 24 seven connected where people have just all these daily stressors. So it's not like when you're running from a lion and then you recover when either you're, you know, if you survive, then you recover and your system goes back to normal. Now we have these sort of chronic stresses, financial worries, the commute, we have 24-7 connectivity, social media, etc., which creates a sort of chronic cortisol high often. And what we call sort of a dysregulation of your HPA axis, which is your hypothalamic hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and i completely agree with you but it's quite interesting to figure out okay what is is it the same thing to say okay at the basis of all this is a dysregulated nervous system or at the basis of this is a dysregulated hormonal system and then all these other things that feed into that so for instance pollutants in our environment or um, pesticides and herbicides and you know all these things that kind of attack us are these things that further exacerbate our nervous system imbalances and then our neuroendocrine system imbalances you know and it's sort of chicken and egg what comes first but I think taking away from what you're saying is that if we treat the nervous system we have a far better chance of sustainably treating the sort of epidemic and mental health crises that we have in our current societies and you know similarly from my perspective i think okay well can we achieve the same results treating the neuroendocrine system which also involves sort of taking cer certain supplements but also calming the system down lowering the cortisol so that the body can come back to homeostasis because the body really knows how to heal itself and i think that's the point of a lot of the work that you do is you know if you can create an environment in which case in which the, the nervous system can be rebalanced and the neuroendocrine the hormones can be rebalanced then in some sense the body can deal with its own inflammation and its own healing so i mean i think we're on the same page but it's quite interesting to look at it from the perspective of the nervous system versus the perspective of sort of the biochemistry which might be upstream from that and I just think in terms of our listeners, you know, from a practical perspective, if you have very difficult life circumstances and you're chronically exhausted and stressed, et cetera, you know, I mean, I think what you were hinting at, sort of meditation, yoga, things that really calm the nervous system down. But do you have any advice on how, you know, if people are suffering from depression or anxiety or the things that they can do for themselves to sort of try and regulate their own nervous system that might help? Well, I think, firstly, one thing that comes to mind very strongly when you talk about how parallel systems interact on each other is this concept of resilience. So resilience is like your, your kind of intervening variable that links all of these things. So you've got different systems running in, at different levels of health. So from the point of view of resilience being an important link between different systems, what people should try and do is build resilience in every system they can. So even if you think your problems are you're terribly anxious because you've got money worries, do everything you possibly can right that will build resilience. So eat healthily, take the right supplements, 
take exercise, try to sleep well, try to do yoga, try to do meditation, try to do Tai Chi, whatever it is that you can make work for you, even though you won't feel like doing it, you don't want to do it. It's the last thing you can bear doing. Go to a 12-step meeting, go to a support group, do something in community, reach out to people. All of these things we never want to do when we're in what we consider to be a mental health crisis or sort of florid addiction. But doing each of them will, uh, will add a drop of resilience somewhere to something. And if you turn those drops into a steady patter of raindrops, it becomes a little rivulet and becomes a river and it becomes a torrent and it becomes a canyon full of water. And that, that steady, strong stream is what you want. That's what it feels like to feel regulated. It's like you know, throw something at me and I'll just absorb it in the river of my resilience and regulation. Whereas if I'm just a dry riverbed, then I can really feel every, every stick and stone of life's misadventures. So it sounds a bit woolly and irritating and difficult to do. But the, one of the things that I think is really worth, um, really worth being a strong advocate of from the perspective you come from is that there's no harm in doing everything. And even if you don't see the individual benefit of, say, for example, I don't know, eating less sugar, your other systems in your body may benefit from the resilience of you not doing something that you couldn't even feel was a problem over there. So do everything, engage with everything, and see what works for you. That's the advice we give to people when they come in the clinic and they see like, you know, 33 hours of program in a week and they say, I don't want to do all of this. And say, well, do it all. And then We'll talk about it after a month and see how you feel. See what works for you. And do you think that if you had known everything that you know now, when you were going through your own breakdown, do you think that you would have had, with this level of information, the, the enough tools in order to heal yourself, you know, maybe doing some outpatient EMDR, some outpatient somatic work, if you had the knowledge that you have now, do you think that you would have been able to pull yourself up from the from essentially what was you know just a, a sort of gulf of of despair, or do you think you were so far gone that at that point, even now with everything that you know, you would not have been able to do this yourself, and you would have required some sort of external intervention? I think by the time I needed treatment, I was pretty far gone. Mm -hmm. I needed to be held. I mean, that's the thing. You know, it's, the goal is to get to a point where you can hold your own nervous system. Mm. Um, but it's a bit like taking a you know, four-day-old old child who's hungry, cold, and miserable, and lost, and alone, and saying, yeah, you can probably figure it out. We can get into states where really we, you know, we need the support of community. We need support of professionals even sometimes. And I was certainly at that stage. But if I'd known everything I know now, first of all, I got the right help much sooner which right. is a key factor in um, mental health recovery. It's getting the right help before you need even more of the right help. And I would have suffered less. My family would have suffered less. It would have been less expensive. And there are lots of things that even now I'm not really doing enough of for myself. And if I'd, if I'd done all of them, if I'd thrown the kitchen sink at it in the right way for the right reasons at the right time, I'm sure that my journey would have been much less horrific. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. Well, look, hopefully, you know, this has been helpful. I think certainly it's been fascinating for me to understand more about the nervous system. And I highly recommend your book, The Invisible Lion, um, which really gives a very detailed and a granular, ex you know, sort of uh, explanation of the nervous system and how to heal it, essentially. And so thank you so much for your time. And thank you for everything that you're doing in terms of this, this clinic, Chiron Clinics, and your book and the work that you do to teach people. And I'm incredibly grateful to you to have you on this program and also incredibly interested in the link between the nervous system as you practice it and as your cohorts practice it and sort of functional medicine, psychiatry that I sort of advocate on my website, etc. So I'm fascinated by that and i'm sure we'll have chances to discuss this further but thank you for your time and um your website is i think if you just want to tell us the the address um, well if you're interested in the book i guess you can go to the invisible lion.com um and if you're interested in treatment chironclinics.com 
will point you in the right direction. Exactly. And so I think, you know, probably you feel that if Chiron clinics had been set up when you were suffering, certainly you would have suffered a lot less. And so... That's how I felt. That's why I wanted to set it up. It's a long way to go to Arizona when you can't get out of bed. Exactly. So thank you so much, Benjamin. And uh, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that your mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you may take to start your healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful. And if you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or check us out on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program. Thank you.